What's up, everyone? This episode is brought to you by Mantra Chain, the security-first, compliance-focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the program. But for now, Mantra, thanks for making the show possible. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by Alyssa Chu of Bitwise. Alyssa, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Me as well. Me as well. And you know, you and I are going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities in uh, crypto equities, but what I want to spend most of this time talking about, it's a little pet project of mine, uh, and I know it's where you're, a fo- you're focusing a lot of your time as well, is on Coinbase. And what I thought would be helpful is we've covered um, some of the specifics around the earnings, uh, their most recent earnings call on the program before. So we can just do a brief sort of review for folks who've missed those past episodes um, on what the actual fourth quarter results were. Guys, if you've listened to me talk about it on the show before, you can skip this section because Alyssa and I are also going to be spending a lot of time breaking down each of the different uh, sort of parts of Coinbase's business and sort of speculating on the the future performance there. But maybe I will uh, share my screen, Alyssa, and just turn it over to you. Uh, if you could just walk us through, like, yeah, the, the kind of highlights of um, the Q4 earnings for Coinbase. <laughs> For sure. Um, So Coinbase reported Q4 2023 earnings on the 15th, and the results overall were pretty strong. The company booked a profit for the first time in two years. Um, They reported revenues of $954 million. This was up 41% quarter over quarter, Um, and they beat Wall Street analyst estimates by 14% on that front. Earnings came in at about $1.14 per share also beating analyst estimates of a dollar and three cents. Um, obviously, the results aren't as strong as the peak of the last bull market, but this definitely reveals, I think, that the company is firing on all cylinders and the best is yet to come for the business. Um, so obviously, Coinbase has been booking net losses for seven straight quarters amidst a challenge crypto market and global macro backdrop. Um, but Q4 2023 was really the turning point, and Coinbase saw full-year earnings of $95 million. These gains can be primarily attributed to an increase in trading revenues, strong subscription and services revenues, as well as prudent expense management as well. Hmm. So, so let's let's dive into that. Um, actually, before we even get into any of the any of the specifics, obviously, none of this is financial advice. Everyone do your own research, et cetera, et cetera. But the price of coin, the stock, uh, has been on an absolute tear. And yeah, I would, I would love to get your sense of when the analysts are looking at this business or what is really responsible for that move. Like, w- what is moving? Uh, what, what is getting investors so positive on Coinbase again? Is it the amount that they were able to control their costs, right? If you're looking, you know, if you're following along via uh, screen here, you can see in 2023, uh, Coinbase posted a $95 million uh, profit as opposed to, in 2022, they lost over 2.6 billion. So they really reined their expense, uh, expenses in uh, while maintaining a very similar revenue profile. Was it on the expense side of thing? Is it uh, a part of their business line that investors are looking at? Like ultimately, what is driving the performance here? I think it's definitely a combination of things. So of course, on the expense front, they've been doing pretty well cutting costs overall. And I think that's a good signal um, in general. Um, I think... When thinking about trading revenues, because the company leans so heavily on transaction revenues, the fact that trading volumes in general have been going up is a huge positive. Um, Add in, obviously, high interest rates, which contributes to the company's stablecoin and fiat balance revenues as well. Um, I think a combination of all those things are really what's like boosting price and bullishness around the stock at the moment. Yeah. And when you when you look at this, uh, so again, for for listeners who are following along, uh, we're looking at the 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 way that Coinbase breaks down their revenue into their is their transaction revenue and their bucket of subscription and services. And within that breakdown, they break it out via consumers. So basically, you know, read retail traders that have uh, very high they pay very high transaction costs for the most part retail, uh, and then the institutional part of their their, their transaction revenue. Um, you know, what what are you seeing on the transaction revenue side here, Alyssa, in terms of Q4 performance, but also, you know, should we be expecting stronger transaction revenue rebounds, uh, you know, in, in the future going forward from here? Is most of that growth going to come from the institutional side or the consumer side? Yeah. T- talk to us a little bit about this transaction revenue line item. Um, for sure. So I really believe that 
last quarter, we saw the retail slowly coming back onto Coinbase's platform. Um, and this is really important because th for the business, Coinbase charges much higher fees in general on retail trading. So in the 2020 to 2021 bull cycle, retail trading ranged from about 28 to 40 percent of total trading volume. Um, but that bottomed out to 14 percent in Q3 of 2023. Um, and the decline exacerbated the pullback in Coinbase's revenue lines. But retail really came back in Q4, accounting for about 19% of total trading volume. And I believe that this will return to higher levels, um, similar to what we've seen in previous bull markets going forward as well. Um, and I think that the company is really well positioned on this front for Q1. Um, the market is up this year, which tends to correlate to rising trading activity. And I was actually just looking at Coinbase's trading volumes as of the end of last week. Um, and in just half of Q1, they've already seen around $120 billion in trading volume, which is equivalent to the total volume that they actually saw in all of Q4. Um, so we can assume that they double um, and see around like a $240 billion um, in trading volumes in Q1, which I think very conservatively could potentially increase um, revenues, transaction revenue specifically by 65% quarter over quarter going forward. Yeah, I think the transaction revenue part of their business is interesting because, you know, Wall Street tends to under, uh, you know, undervalue it a little bit. It's very reflexive. Um, it's very cyclical. And I think generally the perception is that those transaction fees are going to get commoditized away over time. Thing is, though, I, I feel like one of the things about crypto that surprised a lot of people is just how long those transaction fees can actually, uh, you know, Coinbase has been able to hold on to those for a longer period of time than people thought, just because of the, the still the pain that exists in trying to trade crypto on regulated, safe, liquid venues. Um, but I, I, I agree with you in the sense that I think people missed just how volatile the transaction part of their line item was on the downside, but I think they're going to underbase it on the upside as well. And one of the other catalysts that Coinbase has working for them on this transaction part of their revenue is the international uh, trading volume that they're that they're doing. Can you talk to us a little bit about the international, this new uh, part of Coinbase's business, Perps? For sure. Um, so Coinbase International Exchange launched perpetual futures trading in May for non-U.S. institutional investors and then extended that to retail users outside of the U.S. in September. Um, what's incredible is that last week, Coinbase International Exchange perpetual futures surpassed a billion dollars in notional contract volume traded in a single day, which was the first for their non-U.S. exchange. Um, and in Q4 alone, over $16 billion in notional contract volume was actually traded. Um, so I think this is a massive opportunity. And I think in general, um, the global crypto derivatives market represented 75% of total crypto trading volume worldwide in Q4, clearly indicating very strong demand for traders for derivatives. Um, and from a trading volumes perspective, Perpetual has accounted for about 75 to $100 billion of daily liquidity um, and already dominates spot markets by around five times, making them the most liquid instruments in crypto. Um, and obviously, following last year's collapse of FTX, um, which was the largest crypto futures trading platform at the time, overall liquidity and trading volume across the crypto market plummeted. Um, and almost one year later, the market is still reeling from that slump with thin liquidity remaining heavily concentrated across a handful of exchanges. And on the derivatives front, Binance generated roughly $37 billion in trading volume over the past 24 hours, equating to around 10 million in daily revenues from those trading fees. And I think that if Coinbase can slowly capture some of the a portion of that market, it really has the potential to continue um, its streak of beating revenue estimates going forward as well. Nice. And Alyssa, for, for listeners who aren't as familiar, could you just give an overview of what perps are? <laughs> like when we talk about yes, perpetual sure. futures, what exactly is that mechanism? And, you know, after that, like I'd be curious to get your take on. You know, perpetuals have been the sort of derivative of choice for most traders in crypto. That is not what you see in traditional markets where options are very widely adopted. So curious to get your take on the whole options versus perpetuals uh, instrument debate. 
For sure. So perpetual futures are futures contracts with no expiration date, and they basically seek to replicate the performance of an underlying spot asset. So trading perpetual futures, it makes use of margin to enable trading with less upfront funds than traditional spot market trading. So you really see that the leverage will amplify um, gains or on the other direction losses. Um, And I guess like through Coinbase, traders will be using USDC to place these bids on different contracts, um, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and XRP. And each of these contracts will offer up to five times leverage, with some exceptions, um, like XRP, which will only offer three times leverage. Um, and I guess on terms of in terms of the fee side of things, maker orders are zero um, percent fees, and taker orders you'll be charged 0.03% because obviously they remove liquidity from the order book. Um, Yeah. So Alyssa, let's talk, let's um, zoom in a little bit on, on this exchange here. I mean, how much, okay. So for, for the bulk of Coinbase's existence, they've prioritized, especially the U S market is extremely critical to them. And Mm -hmm. their value proposition is that they're the safe regulated venue and you don't, you can trade on Coinbase. You don't have to take the counterparty risk of doing that, you know, trading on Binance or something like that. Mm-hmm. Now they have this this offshore exchange and they're offering all presumably you know they have a very similar set of standards they do in the sort of regulated US part of their business. Uh, but obviously you have this higher growth, potentially higher margin product in the form of perps. So how much of their business does this overall like you know is this ultimately going to be a massive driver in transaction revenues? Do you think that investors and analysts are taking this into account when they're uh, valuing Coinbase, like how much of a driver do you see this being uh, of their overall transaction revenue stream into the future? For sure. I think it's still early days and it's hard to tell how this is going to impact them like longer term, but I do see a massive opportunity here. I don't think um, Wall Street analysts have fully um, priced in the potential growth on this line item specifically, but I am pretty bullish that it's going to be a huge part of um, their revenue streams going forward. I also believe that um, I think the derivatives market is largely unregulated in the crypto space right now. And this is the perfect opportunity for Coinbase to act as the trusted and regulated service provider in this domain, both internationally and hopefully one day in the US as well. Agreed. Completely (laughs) agreed. And I think that'll, that'll probably allow Coinbase to retain some pricing power in terms of fees because okay, maybe it's a little bit more expensive to trade at Coinbase, but you can have a much higher degree of certainty that they're not going to blow up or be doing some crazy stuff a la FTX, whereas you don't have a lot of those assurances at some other offshore, pretty crappy, unregulated exchanges. So yeah, I tend to agree. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Mantra Chain, a security-first, compliance-focused L1 blockchain that paves the way for traditional financial institutions to onboard into Web3. Now, I've talked about Larry Fink on this podcast a bunch. You guys have heard the clips. You've seen him on CNBC. He's talking about his Bitcoin ETF first, then his ETH ETF, and then he loves tokenization. And what that means is he's looking at the trillions of dollars of real world assets out there, and he wants to digitize them and bring them on chain. And to do that, we need a compliant L1 that supports that. And that's exactly what Mantra is. So they're positioned as the blockchain for tokenized RWAs and regulated digital assets. They offer high performance, scalable architecture, and they support both permissionless and regulated compliant applications, which is a pretty cool feature. They're built on the Cosmos SDK. So they've got IBC Interop and they leverage Cosmwasm for smart contracts. And they've got a whole bunch of cool features like Guard Mobile, passportable DIDs, KYC and AML compliance, and the Mantra token surface. So this is relevant for devs. It's relevant for investors. Uh, Definitely go check it out. Testnet phase two is launching soon, and that'll unlock a whole bunch of new opportunities and dApps. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. Again, I get no credit if you don't click the link. uh, So that way Mantra will know that I sent you. So click the link at the bottom of this episode and go check them out for yourself. I want to, I want to zone in on this, this other bucket here. Again, if, if you're following along via video, this is the subscription and services revenue part of their business. And something that was sort of notable that happened on Q3 earnings is that they actually did more in total subscription and services revenue than they did in total transaction revenue. And I think that's, probably not going to hold true, especially as we move further and further into this this bull market and transaction revenues start to recover. 
But within subscription and services, you have stablecoin revenue, blockchain rewards, which is their staking business, interest income, custodial fee revenue, and then this other subscription and services revenue bucket. So you want to to start maybe with stablecoin revenue, um, because that's been a massive part of their business. That's 100 in Q4, that was 171 out of the 375. Uh, that they did so very substantial portion of their uh this bucket like can you talk listeners through where where is this revenue coming from and what is your sort of prognosis on on this part of their business a lot of the usdc revenues are obviously derived from um coinbase's relationship with circle um and it is a massive revenue stream because obviously they're getting exposure to the stablecoin industry and how revenues are made on USDC is basically um, the res- so USDC is backed one to one and the res- the cash reserves are actually invested in short term treasuries that are earning interest and obviously in a high interest rate environment like we are today this means that the income that Coinbase is deriving from USDC um, is generating revenues. All right, let's talk a little bit about their blockchain rewards. And this is, I think, an area that gets slept on a little bit because it's not an enormous part of their overall revenue stream, but I think it's an area that Coinbase is a leader, especially when it comes to uh, centralized companies. Um, and so can you talk to us a little bit about what is the uh, the makeup of Coinbase's staking business? Yeah, so according to Coinbase, um, staking is actually one of the most popular products that they offer that customers engage with. Um as of December 31st, over 7.4 billion worth of assets were staked by their institutional customers through Coinbase Prime. Um, and basically, Coinbase charges a fee on the rewards from staking. Um, I think so. The business model there is that there's no fee to stake or unstake. Rather, Coinbase takes a commission based on the rewards received from the network. And the standard commission there um, is usually 35% for tokens like Matic, Solana, and most of the others, while for Ethereum, it's 25%. Um, I'm not sure the exact breakdown of staked assets in Coinbase, but I'm assuming a majority of it is likely Ethereum. Um, Yeah, and I think longer term, as the on-chain user experience for liquid staking continues to improve, I see more and more cold storage and institutional ETH being staked off of centralized exchanges, or at least in a non-custodial way on those exchanges as well. But for now, it's doing pretty well. Why why is that, Alyssa? I'm not really aware of that dynamic. Say a little bit more about that. Yeah, no. um, I think with... In general, like the move away from centralized financial entities, it's a large push in crypto. Um, so I think going to like a more cold storage solution would be more aligned with the overall um, goal for the industry. Got it. Yeah. And my understanding as well in that, you know, you one of the challenges with the way the staking infrastructure works in crypto today is that uh, you know, just by the way that Ethereum consensus works is you're sort of switching, you know, who the validator is. And oftentimes, like, you don't know who your counterparty is, like, which validator is actually building the block. And so a lot of the staking that has to get done on the institutional standpoint is like they have to spin up their own staking validators. So they'll use some sort of bespoke service to spin up uh, validators so that they know who their kind of counterparty is, so to speak. So I can imagine that's like a massive uh, challenge for the business. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, and I also feel like the regulatory environment surrounding like the staking business is it's a little rocky, um, especially because the SEC had their crackdown on Kraken staking service recently, which they shut down. That was a very interesting moment in time where it felt like the the SEC was sort of winning in the in the um, both public opinion and presumably in the courts, but. That has started to get reversed, and it almost feels like Coinbase is starting to double down on some of their more crypto-native plays that otherwise wouldn't have um, wouldn't have flown even a year ago. And maybe, maybe that was a good transition to getting to talking uh, to starting to talk about Base. So Base is obviously the Coinbase layer two. Today, there's not a token; it exists on Optimism. But uh, Alyssa, can you give us an overview of you know how do you think about Base as an opportunity for for Coinbase? For sure. So I kind of like the framework that Jesse Pollock described BASE as. Um, He said that BASE is a bridge and not an island. 
So it's really designed to optimize for easy access to the Ethereum layer one, other layer twos, and all the other L1s like Bitcoin, Solana, and Cosmos. And I think this is a massive opportunity for Coinbase because, I mean, and for the industry in general, obviously, firstly, um, it would offer a very frictionless onboarding experience from fiat to crypto to on-chain because Coinbase already has over 110 million verified users and over 7 million monthly transacting users. So they have like the stickiness of their user base and the ability to cross-sell this product as well. I think long-term, the opportunity really lies in the fact that Coinbase is making a move towards owning the infrastructure in which the future rails of finance can potentially run on, similar to Amazon's trajectory of going from being an online bookstore to um, having Amazon Web Services. So the opportunity for Coinbase there is they'll get to earn a small fee for every transaction running through Base. Um, they can build out a Web3 app store on Base as well, um, as well as infrastructure to support third-party applications launching businesses on-chain like Amazon Web Services. And I think there's a huge opportunity as well for Coinbase's venture arm because they can focus on seeding the next wave of apps building on base, which can then drive more enterprise value for the company. Yeah, I think that's completely true. And I, you know, maybe ju just to focus on the most uh, obvious tie to revenue, there is the, the sequencer fees that they get to extract. I don't know if you have, um, I can actually look up what those sequencer fees are, but basically... You know, just like in any blockchain, of course, the the transactions that are getting placed on the apps that are built on base need mm -hmm. to be sequenced up. There's MEV, maximum extractable value that you can extract from from doing that, and that's revenue that base the chain ultimately gets to recognize. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on like how significant of a revenue stream is that? Is the overall impact on Coinbase going to be? Hey, like Coinbase Ventures gets to uh, see the next sort of generation of applications that are built on this chain and somehow they get to uh, realize value that way. Like, how, how do you think about the sequencer uh, portion of the revenue versus these other more strategic longer term objectives? Yeah, I think there are opportunities on both fronts. Um, in terms of adoption, I think it's been a little bit on the slower side. So we don't have very um, concrete numbers to work with quite yet in terms of sizing the opportunity longer term. Um, I know that, so Base launched a little over six months ago and they've only acquired around a little under, I think, 2 million users, which was a, a lot lower compared to um, other chains. But yeah, I do see the opportunity growing a lot there. Don't have any concrete numbers for you guys yet though. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe f final part of the questions on the, the Coinbase side of things. One of the things that the analysts were really interested in during this last earnings call was the Coinbase was listed as the custodian for the majority of Bitcoin spot ETFs. And I think on even on the ETH side of things, they were listed as the custodian for like five out of the eight of the applications or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, is this, this going to be a revenue driver for them? Ultimately, custody is a relatively small part of their business. But Brian on the earnings call talked about some other ways that they can monetize. How much, how, how much should we be thinking about the Bitcoin ETFs as a driver for Coinbase? I think initially it'll be a pretty significant driver for now. But longer term, I see that waning a little bit. Um, so the company is a custodian for eight of the 11 funds. And they're going to receive a 0.2% fee and charge additional fees for storing the Bitcoin on top of that. Um, as Coinbase charges custodial fees based on the total value of each account, not the number of Bitcoin. So the price of Bitcoin is one of the determinants of the value of the funds held in custody. So that's kind of like, like we'll see that come and go like through bull and bear markets. Um, it's pretty hard to difficult or it's pretty hard to quantify the impact of the spot Bitcoin ETFs right now, given its early days. And we haven't actually seen the impact in their Q124 earnings quite yet. Um, but we'll see that in the report. Um, but over the long term, I think the company is likely to be a decent beneficiary of this. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And I think there, there's an argument that maybe trading the ETFs is a little bit cannibalistic to Bitcoin earns uh, trading fees on spot Bitcoin. So maybe there's this kind of long term argument where maybe Coinbase loses out because they can't charge trading fees on the ETFs. But 
yeah, I'm, I think it's you'd be you'd really have to bend over backwards to argue that this is not net accretive to Coinbase's business in the short term. So I, know, I agree with you there. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, one more thing that I wanted to ask you about before we move on is the new um, FASB accounting standards, which has implications for Coinbase's business. And I think this really went under the radar of folks who don't follow the space more closely. But for those who, who weren't following this this change, can you just describe what it is and what the impact is on on Coinbase specifically? FASB basically adopt, um, implemented new accounting standards for crypto and these new rules will only be implemented for the first time in um, Q1 2024. Um, but basically, FASB ruled that companies can use fair value accounting when measuring crypto assets. Prior to this, businesses reporting under US GAAP accounted for crypto assets as indefinite lived tangible assets, so similar to IP. And under the indefinite lived tangible asset accounting model, crypto assets were not amortized. Um, instead, they were written down to a fair value whenever the fair value fell bef- below the carrying amount. So, for example, if the price of Bitcoin fell, companies would have to report it um, as a loss. But on the flip side, if it rose, entities could actually not mark up the value unless they sold their crypto. So going forward, this new rule um, is going to be a major unlock as companies will now be able to account for and disclose the true value of their crypto assets in their financials every single quarter going forward. Um, And I think this sets up um, major corporate adoption as clear accounting standards will alleviate reluctance to hold crypto assets on balance sheets. Yeah, it is crazy. I don't know if folks out there who hold any crypto have ever applied for a loan or anything where you have to list your assets. But I mean, it is not. You actually used to get penalized for (laughs) holding crypto. Now, on a personal loan, it's a net zero, at least. (laughs) It's like literally not you know, yeah, punitive to hold crypto. And yeah, just the, the accounting, the way that crypto is, the accounting rules around crypto on, uh, you know, public company balance sheets is just so nuts. Uh, so it's, it's it's a really good thing that they're that they're getting an up, upgrade here and it'll make it much easier for things like banks to ultimately touch the underlying as well, which- is Oh yeah, we definitely. Um, yeah, and in their 10K, Coinbase actually noted that they anticipate- um, they'll recognize an incremental 720 to 760 million increase in the fair value of their crypto assets. So just like thinking about something like that, it's massive. I agree. Totally. Hey, everyone. We'll be back to the program in just a moment. But before we return, wanted to let you know about DAS London. DAS London is the largest institutionally focused conference in crypto hosted by Blockworks. But I want to give you an update because we are now 10 times oversubscribed for this conference. So the bad news is we have actually got to lower, as much as I love you guys, the listeners, we've got to lower our discount rate to margin 10. That's going to get you 10% off. I would highly recommend that you do that soon because you might have noticed ticket prices have gone up 200 pounds and they're only going up from here. And I actually can't guarantee that we're going to have this discount rate forever. Since we last talked, we've had a whole bunch of new great speakers sign up for the conference. We've got Brad Garlinghouse as a keynote. We've got Pascal Gauthier as a keynote. We've got new speakers signed on from Goldman Sachs, from Franklin Templeton, uh, from some of the largest family offices and allocators based out of Europe. So Theta Capital Management, L1 Digital. And actually on day one of the conference, we're going to be having an investor day, which is a Chatham House Rules hosted by some of the largest investors in crypto. Then the other thing that happened is we've got our VIP tickets that just went live. There are only 60, but we've actually had a bunch of them that just sold out even in one day. So if you want to be a VIP at the conference, make sure you get your ticket. And again, use code MARGIN10 uh, to hang out with me and Mark uh, March 18th to the 20th in sunny London. Cheers. Thank you. Well, so I wanted to get your perspective on you know how you might view the, the Bitcoin miners. So that's kind of the other section of if, if you want to get exposure to crypto through the public market and you don't really want to touch the underlying yourself, what you could be doing is looking at Bitcoin miners. So just from a high level, can you give listeners a sense of how you would uh, evaluate miners as an investment opportunity relative to something like even Coinbase or Bitcoin itself? I think there are some risks in, or it's really hard to pick the winners and losers in this space um, because obviously the, the having is going to put immense pressure on these names. So when picking what stock, what miner to invest in, I think it's really important to look at miner economics. Um, so looking for favorable power contracts, hardware cost management, um, like maintenance fees, cooling costs, etc. cetera. Um, 
But yeah, ultimately a very different play than investing in Bitcoin, the asset itself. Um, I think it, some investors are more comfortable investing in um, a company like, or in Bitcoin millionaires in general, because they understand um, like the revenue model. These are cash. Um, these are um, companies that are actually derive revenues as opposed to investing in an asset like Bitcoin, which traditional investors find hard valuing. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think one of the one of the benefits of Bitcoin miners is that they actually produce cash flows, and you can use a DCF to spit out a valuation. I do I do think people read into that a little bit too much, and at least my my personal view on the miners is that it's they're kind of a levered play on Bitcoin in a sense. I mean, you, you can just look at how their stocks perform relative to the underlying, and I mean, it really does it goes pretty one to one. And actually, the miners have way outperformed. I think Bitcoin on the way. On the way up, and similarly, at the end of 2022, one of the things that people didn't really understand was, hey, these cash flows are actually extremely dependent on, on the underlying price of Bitcoin, and oh, these companies have a lot of debt. That's how they've been financing themselves, so that might be a little problematic as well. So it's it's just a, it's an interesting sector, and in some ways, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Bitcoin or the gold miners relative to gold itself. There's a whole class of investors who love to invest in the miners because they can value the cash flows, but they're tricky businesses to invest in. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, yeah, too. Absolutely. Very operationally intensive. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, Alyssa, I, I know you're, in, you know, in your in your seat at uh, Bitwise. You know, you, you probably tend to focus pretty much on sort of crypto equities, but you know, I wanted to get your your overall take on just where we are in the stock market as well. Like we've talked a little bit about on the show about. Uh, Magnificent Seven, and we had obviously Nvidia earnings last week, which you know we don't need to go into the weeds of and rehash. But the market felt like it was really on edge. Uh, there was a lot of call vol, uh, you know, options volume around the uh, just before the earnings. Uh, the Nvidia NVDA, the stock actually sold off about ten percent, and there was a lot of concern about like, hey, if you know where goes Nvidia, so goes the market. There were all these quotes from Goldman Sachs calling this the most important earnings release uh, of the year. Crazy stuff like that, but they they blew earnings out of the water, and now it looks like uh, they've sort of paved the way for investors to continue to take risk on the on the equity side of things. So, what's your sort of you know we've been we've been really zoning in on some of the crypto equities here, but like where does this sit you know relative to your framework for how the rest of the stock market is doing? Yeah, so I think obviously crypto is a little bit different because. It's um, a cyclical industry and therefore the crypto equities kind of follow suit where the um, crypto assets are trading. I think overall, the markets are pretty well positioned to um, outperform this year, especially with upcoming rate cuts coming on. I think investors are going to be willing to take on more um, risk on assets such as crypto and high growth tech stocks. Um, so overall, pretty bullish going forward. Feels like a lot of the pain that we saw with the initial rate hikes back in 2022 and early 23, I, maybe maybe we felt the worst of that. And the economy actually has been growing quite a bit. GDP prints mm -hmm. have been really hot. And it feels like earnings are, for the most part, are on a pretty good path. And yeah. who knows? I mean, hard to, hard to evaluate AI as well and how much of a narrative that is, how real it is. Um, there's probably probably little bits of both. There's a timeline element to this as well in terms of how mm -hmm. long, you know, until this promising technology can actually lead to real production increases. But yeah, I, I am also feels like it's a good place to be pretty constructive here. Yeah, totally agree with you. Yeah. Well, Alyssa, any um, any like closing thoughts, anything maybe we didn't get to on the Coinbase side of things, general market sentiment, crypto in general, you know, we're talking about this on a day where at, you know, as as the current time, Bitcoin has crossed uh, fifty four thousand. So it seems like there's a pretty relentless march higher. I mean, any any closing thoughts on anything maybe that we didn't didn't get to? I think on the Coinbase front, we covered it all. Um, I think what I'm excited for going forward is kind of the IPO market, um, especially in the crypto equities space. So obviously, yeah. um, a big deal that didn't go through in the past was the Circle IPO. But obviously, earlier this year, they filed initial paperwork with the SEC to IPO, hopefully hopefully sometime soon. Um, but in their previous plans to go public via SPAC, um, 
at that time, the company was valued at $9 billion. Um, and obviously, Coinbase, with their stake in Circle now, um, will benefit from that as well. So, yeah. And I think in general, I'm pretty bullish on um, the payment space and what Coinbase is doing um, in relationship with Circle through USDC to enable those use cases. I haven't really checked this chart uh, for market cap on USDC, but USDC, because of the, I mean, really through no fault of its own, back, I think it, it peaked around, um, yeah, ultimately market cap for USDC is it peaked at 55 billion. It sort of receded in line with what, uh, what was expected during, you know, a, a really tough 2022. But USDC briefly depegged in March as a result of SVB, where it kept a small amount of its assets. And it really just set off this um, decline in in market cap all the way down to 24. But over the last three months or so, it looks like uh, they've been able to pretty steadily grow back. And USDC is sitting at over 28 billion today, which I wouldn't have necessarily thought about. So also a bullish sign for the overall yeah. market. And yeah, Circle's a great company. I would love to see more great um, crypto uh, companies trading publicly in the US. I think that'd be a win yeah. for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, you know spending your time with us. If folks want to find out more about you, follow the good work that you do, or what you're up to at Bitwise, like what's the best way for for folks to do that? Um, probably through Twitter. Pretty active there. Follow me at Melissa True underscore. Um, sometimes I post on LinkedIn as well, but I, I'd say mostly Twitter. <laughs> awesome, cool. Well, Alyssa, thank you so much. It was really great to chat with you, and we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. This was fun. You bet. Thanks for listening.